At 48, I sat in my office overlooking the Pacific, contemplating my company's offer. Accepting it would net me about $24 million, making me incredibly wealthy. Despite this, I felt miserable. Professionally, I was successful, but personally, my life was a mess. My name is Jerry Ford, Jerome, not Gerald, like the president. I came from a blue-collar, lower-middle-class family and was a screw-up in high school because I found it boring. My guidance counselor even suggested I drop out and find a job. I was a pain in the back. Somehow, I graduated high school, probably because they wanted to get rid of me. The Vietnam War was raging, and I enlisted in the Army for three years, eager to serve. My dad, an electrician, thought it would help me mature and learn a trade. To my surprise, I thrived in basic training. The discipline and physical demands appealed to me, and I excelled. This led to volunteering for ranger training, a grueling two-month program at Fort Benning, Georgia, preparing for Vietnam. I wasn't a big guy, just under six feet and 170 pounds, but I stayed in shape by swimming. The training honed my body and survival skills. Two months later, I was in Vietnam, which was far from pleasant. I spent over a year and a half there until shrapnel wounded me, damaging my spine and bladder. After months in a veteran's hospital, I was discharged. Fortunately, I wasn't incontinent, and my limp is barely noticeable today. The inability to have children didn't bother me much then but would haunt me later. At 20, out of the army with no real skills except combat, I was back home, unsure of my next steps. My dad found a VA-sponsored counseling program at Drexel University. After a day of testing, Dr. Cypress suggested I study engineering based on my aptitudes. Despite my poor high school performance, he convinced me I could succeed in college. I enrolled at Drexel, majoring in electrical engineering, making my parents proud. Around that time, I got a call from my old buddy, Ben Klein. Jerry, it's Ben. I'm out of the army. Ben, it's great to hear from you. How come you got out early? Where are you? How did you get my number? I was excited to hear his voice. I lost a leg to a mine, but the prosthesis is great, and I get around fine. I called your folks for your number. I'm in California now, studying architecture at Caltech. I'm going to be an architect, Jerry. I laughed. Ben was probably the smartest guy in our unit. That's fantastic, Ben. I'm really happy for you. My folks must have told you I'm studying engineering. Yeah, I heard. Can you believe it? Us becoming professionals, you an engineer and me an architect? We laughed and talked for another half hour, promising to keep in touch. I decided not to commute from home and, using my GI Bill, a small medical pension and money my folks saved, I got a tiny studio apartment near school. It had a bed, some chairs, a sofa, a kitchenette, and a small bathroom. But, it was enough for me. I set up a study area with a desk and a used computer and focused on my studies, knowing my future depended on it. I could walk to class and take the streetcar to visit my folks. The first two years flew by, and I was surprised to find I did well in my exams. I was serious about becoming an engineer, which left little time for a social life. I made some casual friends, and we occasionally went out for beer or pizza. One Friday, a classmate, Carl, invited me to a sorority party at Penn. I decided to go, and that night changed my life. I met Kimberly, who seemed like a rich girl with her stylish clothes and diamond earrings. My contempt showed, and she sensed it. Feeling guilty, I quickly got a beer. We eventually talked about marriage, and I worried about how she'd react to my sterility. One day, Kim confessed, Jerry, I love you and want to be with you forever, but I don't want children. I wouldn't make a good mother tears welled up in her eyes. I'll understand if you want to break up. I hugged her. Kim, if you don't want children, then I don't either. My sterility was now irrelevant, and I didn't even need to mention it. Ironically, Kim was lax about taking her birth control pills, often skipping days. It never caused any problems for us, reinforcing her belief that missing a few days didn't matter. In our case, it didn't. Jerry, Kim said one afternoon, I think it's time for you to meet my parents. They want to meet you. I knew this was coming, but I dreaded it. I felt sick, convinced they'd see me as unworthy. The meeting was set for Sunday. I looked into Kim's family. They were high society. Bernard Van Horn owned a huge construction firm and was worth hundreds of millions. His wife Catherine came from old money. I felt out of place. Her dad sent a black Lincoln town car to pick us up. I was in a foul mood, but Kim reassured me. We arrived at their large, impeccably maintained colonial house. Kim led me inside, calling out for her parents. To my surprise, they were incredibly welcoming, treating me like family. Catherine was polite, but with a hint of caution. She was about 5'5", blonde, blue-eyed, and youthful-looking for her age, probably mid-40s. I thought, if Kim ages like this, I can live with that. 
Bernie insisted I call him by his first name, which felt odd given his wealth and stature. He was tall, distinguished, and very rich, but immediately took a liking to me, interested in my background and studies. As we left, he said, Jerry, I'm impressed. Keep up your studies. I can always use a good engineer. He laughed and slapped my back, telling Kim, You got a keeper. On the ride back, Kim snuggled into me, relieved. I sighed, glad it was over, but now thinking about Kim meeting my folks. The contrast between her family's estate and my parents' South Philly row house would be stark, but I knew my parents would welcome her warmly. Kim's visit to my parents' home went well. She was surprised by their modest living conditions, but handled it gracefully. Occasionally I saw a look in her eyes that unsettled me, but I knew she wouldn't look down on anyone. She and my mom bonded in the kitchen over a pot roast recipe, even though I doubted Kim could cook. My dad took me outside and said, Jerry, Kim seems great and loves you. But she's used to privilege. Engineering pays well, but maybe not enough for her expectations. Just think about it. He patted my shoulder and we went back inside. When we were in the front parlor, my dad brought out wine glasses and made an announcement. Jerry, Kim, a toast to your happiness. May your lives together be long and joyful. And now we have sold the house and are moving to Florida. We bought a small villa on the West Coast and I've got a part-time job there. Retired of the cold and moving by the end of the month. Cheers. I was stunned but happy for them, joking that they should keep the second bedroom ready for our visits. I noticed a look in Kim's eyes but ignored it. Kim suggested we combine what her parents paid for her lodging with my rent and get a real apartment together. It made sense, so we rented a nice place nearby. Kim insisted she needed a car for school, so her dad bought her a BMW. Our senior year went well. Kim was busy with her studies and wedding plans while I focused on maintaining high grades. Despite our busyness, we spent less time together. Two months before graduation, Kim came home with exciting news. Jerry, I got a part-time job starting next week. If it goes well, it could become full-time after graduation. She was thrilled. She'd be a probationary assistant editor at a large publishing house in Center City. I whined a bit about our lack of time together. Geez, Kim, we barely see each other now. It'll be worse. I know, but this is a golden opportunity. Please be happy for me, she pleaded. I forced a smile and encouraged her. You'll be great, honey. They'll love you. She danced around the apartment while I felt a sense of foreboding. It actually worked out. Kim worked a couple of evenings when I had late classes, so we didn't lose much time together. The semester flew by and suddenly our wedding day arrived. The ceremony was in a ritzy hotel with over 200 guests, but only a few were my family and friends. I felt like I was in a haze, letting events carry me through. That evening, Kim's father, Bernie, took me aside to a room off the ballroom. Jerry, I know you have resumes out, but I want you to consider working for me. I need to bolster my technical department and I want you to train with Donna, our head electrical engineer. This is a real job with room for advancement and I'll pay you more than anyone else. He grinned and I recognized this was a great opportunity. We shook hands, agreeing that Kim and I would make it on our own and that was our contract. My parents gave us a beautiful sterling silver service for 12, which probably strained their budget. My in-laws gifted us a 10-day vacation in Jamaica. I felt awkward about them paying for our honeymoon, but didn't want to refuse. I started feeling uneasy about the Van Horn's influence on our relationship. Kim and I had discussed this, and she knew I wanted us to be independent. She brushed off my concerns, but they were real to me. Our biggest disagreement was where to live after graduation and our wedding. Kim wanted to buy an apartment in a high-rise in Center City, close to her job and the Van Horn building where I would work. I insisted we rent a place we could afford and buy later when we were financially ready. Kim was furious that I wouldn't accept help from her parents. I made it clear that we had to make it on our own. She eventually agreed, though grudgingly. We found a nice two-bedroom, two-bath apartment near our jobs. Kim had her car, and I could take a streetcar to work. It was convenient. We went into debt for furniture, but I managed Kim's spending, and we furnished the place nicely. Bernie kept his word, and my job was demanding but rewarding. I worked closely with Don Malone, an experienced engineer who taught me a lot. I quickly realized that college was just the beginning of my learning. I often stayed late, eager to learn as much as possible. Kim was also dedicated to her job, advancing from assistant to full-fledged editor within two years. She earned good money, and we saved for a place of our own. 
Kim still wanted a luxury apartment in Center City and often criticized our current place, calling it squalid once. Her attitude strained our relationship. I stayed in touch with Ben Klein, who kept urging me to move to California, but I was content where I was and knew Kim wouldn't want to move. Ben was persistent, but I had to laugh at his efforts. One Friday evening, I had made reservations at a fancy restaurant, had two dozen roses in a crystal vase, and a velvet box with diamond earrings for Kim. It was our second wedding anniversary, and I bet she thought I had forgotten since she hadn't mentioned it. The phone ringing interrupted my thoughts. Jerry, Kim said, I'm really sorry, but I'll be late tonight. We have a million things to do for Paul's new novel, and I'll be here for a few more hours. I'll grab something to eat and see you around ten. She hung up before I could reply. I looked at the roses on the sideboard, wondering if she even remembered it was our anniversary. Her job seemed more important. We had both been so focused on work that we neglected our marriage. It felt like we were just roommates. Kim had been consumed by the launch of Paul Lavelle's novel. She was excited, but I grew tired of hearing about him. I met him at a reception months ago and found him arrogant. Kim was wearing a revealing black dress that night, which made me uneasy. When she introduced me to Lavelle, he tried to hurt me with a handshake, but I quickly put him in his place. He sneered, calling me the engineer, and laughed. Kim looked embarrassed. The rest of the evening, she stayed by his side, and he kept giving me challenging looks. A week later, Kim stopped talking about Lavelle and the project. When I brought him up, she changed the subject. I started feeling suspicious and paranoid, but I tried to dismiss it. Our marriage was on autopilot, and Kim was distant. We hadn't been carnal in weeks. A week before our anniversary, I decided to surprise Kim at work and take her to dinner. I went to Crown Publishing and accidentally got off on the executive floor, where I ran into James Frost, the VP. Jerry, good to see you. It's been a while, he said, patting my shoulder. Hi, Jim. I got off on the wrong floor. I'm here to take my wife to dinner. Hopefully she's not too busy with the Lavelle thing. Oh no, that's over. Paul's still in the VIP apartment upstairs, but the book's at the printer. Go grab Kim. She deserves a good dinner. He smiled and walked away. I went to Kim's office and saw her in the hall. She looked startled. Jerry, what are you doing here? She blurted. Hi, Kim. I thought we could have dinner out tonight. It's been a while and I thought we could spend some time together. I saw a flash of annoyance in her eyes. I can't, Jerry. I'm busy with Paul's novel. Please be patient. This will be over soon. I promise. I'll try to get home earlier tonight. She patted my cheek and returned to her office. I left, realizing it was almost eleven. Kim's promise to be home by ten was like her other empty promises. I threw the roses, vase and all, into the trash and tossed the earrings into my desk drawer. I went to bed but couldn't sleep, suspecting she was having an affair with Lavelle. When she came home around 1 a.m., freshly showered, I pretended to be asleep. Her behavior confirmed my suspicions. The next morning, I went to the office to think. I knew my marriage was over and needed evidence of her infidelity. I found a private investigation firm near Van Horn Construction and set up an appointment with Marge DeMarco. At her office, Marge listened to my suspicions and explained the difficulty of gathering legal evidence from the VIP apartment. Marge, I don't care about legality. I just want confirmation, I insisted. She looked at me with pity. Okay, Jerry, give us a couple of weeks. Here's our fee information and contract. Sign it and mail it back with a check. We'll start Monday. I nodded, shook her hand and left, feeling a bit better for taking action. When I got home, Kim was in the kitchen, furious. God damn it, Jerry, where did you go? Do you remember it's our anniversary? Did you get me a card or make any gesture? I stood silently, realizing she was trying to deflect the blame. Kimberly, I replied calmly. Today is the 11th. Our anniversary was yesterday. The roses I got you are in the trash. I canceled our dinner reservations. If you look in my desk, you'll find the gift I got you. Clearly, last night was more important considering you stayed out until almost 1 a.m. She looked frightened, her eyes darting everywhere, avoiding my gaze. She paled but tried to collect herself. I'm sorry, Jerry, she said, sitting on the sofa. I don't know where I am half the time. This campaign has me frazzled. It's over, Jerry. The campaign is finally over. Let's try to forget the past couple of months and work on our marriage. She didn't know that I knew the project had ended long ago, her guilt was evident. I didn't escalate the situation, but the tension remained all week. Kim was home every evening around five, indicating her affair with Lavelle had ended. But it was too late for me. The trust was gone, and our marriage felt like a charade. A few days later, Ben Klein called. Jerry, have you thought about moving out here? 
The opportunities are unlimited. We could use a good electrical engineer. Ben had been trying to get me to move for a while. It's an idea, Ben. I'm not sure, but we can talk about it again. A few days later, Marge DeMarco called me to her office. Jerry, I have some news, but I don't know if you'll be happy. We haven't found any evidence to confirm your suspicions, so I'm refunding a portion of our fee. Our inquiries into Paul Lavelle's background revealed he's a womanizer with three settled maltreatment complaints and two divorces linked to him. I'm sorry we couldn't be more help. I was disappointed, but resigned. I called John Kramer, an attorney, and made an appointment for ten days later. It was time to end this. Meanwhile, Kim and I tiptoed around each other. A couple of days before my appointment, Kim rushed into the house, agitated. Jerry, sit down. I need to talk to you. I know we didn't want children, but I'm pregnant. We're going to be parents, Jerry. Please don't be angry. Please be happy for us. She looked at me, anxiety written all over her face. I was stunned, completely floored. For a moment, I couldn't even think. Then the absurdity hit me. Kim had always been careless with her birth control pills, and now she was pregnant with Lavelle's child, trying to convince me it was mine. I felt a mix of rage and devastation. I realized she had betrayed me and it left me feeling empty and cold inside. I'll pack a few things and leave. I'll get the rest later when you're not here, I said. Kim looked frightened and started to cry. I'm sorry, Jerry. You don't know how sorry I am. Why, Kim? Was our marriage so unimportant to you? I asked softly. She looked at me with watery eyes. I asked myself that too. Maybe it was the excitement, the glamour. I have no excuses. I was weak and foolish. I let myself be seduced by Paul and the job. I didn't realize how deep I was until it was too late, she said, crying. I'm so ashamed. Lying to you about the baby was despicable. I'm truly sorry. Is there any way? she asked, already knowing the answer. No, I replied. I have an appointment with John Kramer. Get a lawyer. We'll split what we have and finalize the divorce without problems. I packed a bag and left. Kim was still crying as I walked out. Telling Bernie Van Horn was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Why, Jerry? Why? Haven't I treated you well? You're like a son to me, Bernie said with tears in his eyes. Bernie, I can't give you details, but Kim will explain. She left me with no choice. You've been like a second father to me, and I'm grateful. But I can't explain more, I said, struggling to hold back my emotions. Bernie seemed to understand and placed his hand on my shoulder. Okay, Jerry, do what you have to do. Promise you'll let me help you whenever I can, he said. I nodded and left. I spent the next week at a Hilton, trying to process everything. I filed for divorce, knowing it wouldn't be contested. Realizing there was nothing left for me here, I called Ben Klein and was on a plane to L.A. within a week. Ben had already submitted my resume to his company, and I started the job a few days after arriving. I stayed with Ben and his wife Rachel for a couple of weeks until I found an apartment near work. Rachel who I'd only talked to on the phone before, was warm and welcoming. She made me feel more than just a guest in their home. She was about 5'3", beautifully built with dark hair and brown eyes. She became a special friend, and I was happy for both Ben and Rachel. Weeks passed, and I threw myself into work, grateful for the distraction. The nights were tough, filled with dark dreams and memories of Kim. Sometimes I drank too much and let my anger out by smashing things, then passed out on the sofa. I missed the Kim I had married, not the one who betrayed me. I wondered if her infidelity was partly my fault, but I couldn't forgive her or accept the child. Ben and Rachel kept me sane. They invited me to spend weekends at their place, go camping, or set me up on blind dates, which I avoided. I spent many weekends with them, finding some peace by their pool. Bernie and Catherine Van Horn also called occasionally, never mentioning Kim, just checking in. Their concern touched me. Things got weird at Ben and Rachel's. They were like family. But Rachel's bikinis got skimpier, and awkward encounters happened often. Rachel would be in the hall in her underwear, or a barely there bikini. I felt uncomfortable, but didn't want to make a move on Rachel. One Saturday, Ben went to get beer, insisting I stay. I came out of the bathroom and saw Rachel in a short silk robe, wide open with nothing underneath. She took my hand and led me to the patio. Rachel, tie your robe. Ben will be home soon, I stammered. She ignored me and said, Don't worry about Ben, we need to talk. She sat across from me, her robe open. Jerry, stop feeling sorry for yourself. You're not the only guy who got crapped on. You can't avoid women forever. I blushed, panicking. Rachel stood, let the robe fall, and took my hand. Don't worry, Jerry. I'm not going to screw you. Ben and I thought this might snap you out of your depression. 
She put the robe back on and tied it. We did this out of love and affection for you. Holy crap, Rachel, what's Ben going to think of this? I asked, worried. Rachel smiled. Don't worry, Jerry. Ben knows exactly what I intended to do, and he agreed. He trusts you with his life, and he feels the same about me. He thought this might help you get back in the game. Ben returned later, grinning. His humor eased my guilt. To defend myself, I started accepting blind dates they set up. Surprisingly, many of the women were nice, and I enjoyed the dates, even though I knew they wouldn't go anywhere. I still loved Kim and missed her terribly. Letting go of that love was my biggest obstacle. What kept me grounded was the companionship of Ben and Rachel. They constantly invited me over and encouraged me to date. Spending weekends by their pool helped me relax. Bernie and Catherine Van Horn also kept in touch, showing genuine concern. So I started to move on. I joined a health club, took a cooking class, and even considered joining a library group. Ben and Rachel were happy I was back in the game. I kept busy with work and occasional dates, slowly recovering from my breakup with Kim. Two years passed since I moved to the West Coast. I operated in a semi-fog, going through the motions. Then my world changed again. One Thursday evening, my mom called, crying. My dad had a massive stroke and died. I felt lightheaded but knew I had to stay strong. I called Ben. Ben, my dad had a massive stroke. He died. I need you to contact personnel and get me a leave of absence. Of course, Jerry. Don't worry about anything here. Just take care of your family, Ben responded sympathetically. I packed and was on a plane to Tampa a few hours later. I landed early the next morning and rented a car. At the house, I found a note from Mrs. Simmons, the neighbor, asking me to call her. Mrs. Simmons, this is Jerry Ford. I just got your note. She interrupted. Jerry, your mom had a heart attack and was rushed to the hospital. She'll be fine, so stay calm. I'll be right over. Five minutes later, Mrs. Simmons, or Katie, arrived and explained everything. My mom had experienced neck and arm pains, and Katie called emergency. Mom was taken to the ER, examined, and scheduled for bypass surgery later in the week. I immediately headed for the door when Katie stopped me. She spoke calmly. Jerry, wait for me. Give me 15 minutes to get ready, and I'll go with you instead of giving you directions to the hospital. I paused, feeling relief as she hugged me. Don't worry, Jerry. Your mom will be okay. She's only 56 and has many good years left. Thanks, Katie. I appreciate your support, I said, grateful for her help. Then I waited for her to get ready. We reached the hospital and I finally saw my mom. She was in shock from my dad's pass away and didn't want the surgery. I convinced her she needed to be there for me and she agreed to the operation. She had surgery five days later and recovered quickly. Within a week, she was home and we were taking short walks together. During her hospital stay, I arranged my dad's funeral. It was well attended by friends and neighbors, all shocked at his passing at just 60. I insisted my mom not attend due to her recent surgery, promising we would visit his grave when she was ready. I pondered my future while staying with my mom. I felt reluctant to leave her alone. After discussions with Ben and Rachel, I decided to quit my job and move closer to her. Ben arranged for a moving company to pack and ship my things, including my car. Their help was invaluable. Mom's recovery was impressive, though she needed afternoon naps. With my help and Katie's, who was also recently widowed, Mom was doing well. I decided it was time to look for a job. I discussed my plan with Mom. She suggested we pool our resources and start a business together. I have confidence in you, Jerry. We can be partners. I can run the office and you can handle the technical work. I was surprised but intrigued. I saw potential in the idea, especially with small contractors needing engineering services. I consulted Ben, who encouraged me to go for it. Mom and I pooled our money and opened a small office. I advertised in local trade publications and introduced myself to contractors. Slowly, work started coming in. Within a few months, we were covering expenses, though not yet making a profit. Then, out of the blue, I received a bid request for a mid-size office building. I worked on the bid for hours, minimizing my profit margin, and won. I had to expand quickly to meet the deadline but had enough time to hire more help. Soon, more work came in, and I expanded three more times over the next few years until we occupied an entire floor in a new high-rise. I knew I was lucky, hitting a building boom just in time. The first couple of years were all about building the business, leaving me little social time. After about three years, I had enough help to cut back on hours, rejoin the gym, and start working out again. Forget cooking classes. I was still terrible, but Mom helped with that. At the gym, I met Mary Susan Black. She was about 5'5", five, five, nicely built and around my age. One day, I noticed her leotard's lap seam was about to tear. I awkwardly approached her, 
trying to warn her without embarrassing her. Uh, miss, I stammered. Look, I really don't want to be... I mean, she smiled. You're really not very good at this, are you? You should practice before trying to introduce yourself to a girl. She giggled, making it less awkward. I whispered about her leotard, and she quickly ran to the locker room. I couldn't get her out of my mind. She didn't show up for a week, and I assumed she was too embarrassed to return. But the next week, she approached me. Hi, she said. My name is Mary Black. Thank you for warning me. I smiled. You're welcome. Would you have lunch with me today? I'm Jerry Ford, I said, extending my hand. She smiled and shook my hand, agreeing to lunch. We got to know each other over the next few weeks. Mary was 28, divorced, with a three-year-old daughter named Stacy. She worked in public relations for an advertising company near the gym. After our third date, I met Stacy. She was a charming little girl with blonde hair and blue eyes, nothing like her mother. Stacy quickly warmed up to me, and Mary was surprised, saying her daughter didn't usually open up to strangers so easily. Dating Mary became even more enjoyable because of Stacy. I liked Mary a lot, but I didn't love her the way I had loved Kimberly. It wasn't fair to compare them, but I knew I was different now too. Mary was pretty, dynamic, and had a strong personality. She was sweet and kind, especially with Stacy, her three-year-old daughter, whom I adored like my own. Our relationship was comfortable, but not very physical, just some kissing and fumbling. One night at Mary's condo, after dinner and some wine, Mary suddenly became very aggressive. We had wild lovemaking and fell asleep together. The next morning, Mary explained that the wine had lowered her inhibitions and she wanted to make love. I reassured her that she was perfect. We continued dating for months and became very comfortable with each other. I introduced Mary and Stacy to my mom who had retired. Mom adored Stacy, treating her like a grandchild. Stacy loved her Nana and everything felt right. We never discussed love or the future, but were content with the status quo. Eventually, we decided it was silly to keep running between our places, so I bought a house in a gated golf course community. We moved in two months later. Marriage never came up. Both our previous marriages had ended badly, and we were happy without that commitment. Stacy started calling me daddy, and I felt like her dad. Life was good. The years passed quickly, one blending into another. My company thrived with a great reputation and I had a strong team to keep it growing. I no longer had to struggle to keep it afloat. I stayed in touch with Bernie and Kate Van Horn, talking a couple of times a year, and always kept in contact with Ben and Rachel. Mary was doing well too, climbing the corporate ladder to become the director of public relations. However, as she advanced, she worked longer hours and traveled more, usually being home around the same time as me, though sometimes late. Stacy grew into a beautiful, kind, and intelligent young woman. Now almost 20, she was finishing her sophomore year at an Ivy League university. Life was good until things started to change. Over the past few months, Mary seemed indifferent, apathetic, and preoccupied. I thought it might be my imagination, but I noticed our bed life had become sporadic. We used to have lovemaking two or three times a week, but now it had been almost two weeks since our last time. Mary often said she was tired or had her period. I began to suspect something was wrong, fearing it might be happening again. I decided to talk to Mary after dinner. Mary, I began, we need to talk. I feel like something's wrong. You seem distant, and it's like you've forgotten I'm here. What's the problem? I kept my voice soft and non-accusatory. She stared at me. What the hell are you talking about, Jerry? Are you getting paranoid? Are you accusing me of something? Get off my back. She then stormed out and slammed the bedroom door. I was stunned. Mary had never spoken to me like that. I realized I had noticed a tone of disrespect, maybe even contempt from her lately. I wasn't imagining it. I decided to find out what was going on, just like I had done years ago. I slept in the guest suite that night. Mary emerged the next morning, red-eyed and tearful, apologizing profusely. We made up and promised not to fight again. Mary blamed job stress, claiming a big client was on the brink of leaving. I didn't believe her and decided to find out what was really going on. Mary's late nights and occasional travel weren't unusual, but recently they'd become more frequent. I suspected something was up and contacted a private investigator. I explained my concerns and provided the necessary details and a hefty check. Over the next few weeks, things were strained between Mary and me. We avoided arguments but remained wary. I waited for the investigator's report, already suspecting the worst. When the report came, it confirmed my fears. Mary was meeting a man named Howard Branch, a 48-year-old divorced guy. They met at restaurants, held hands, kissed, and checked into hotels. She also saw him during her business trips. 
I was hurt but not as devastated as with my first wife. I realized I wasn't strong enough to handle this betrayal. I consulted my attorney, thinking a separation would be simple since we weren't legally married. He warned it could still be messy and suggested a mutual agreement to avoid court. The following Friday after dinner, I confronted Mary. How long have you been seeing him? I asked softly. Mary looked shocked and teary. I'm sorry, Jerry. I hoped you wouldn't find out, she said, tears streaming down her face. How long, Mary? I know his name, Howard Branch. Do you love him? She lowered her head, sobbing. About eight months. I saw him at the mall. He's my ex-husband, Stacy's father. It felt like a knife to my chest. Stacy's father? No, I'm Stacy's father, I exploded. No one will take that away from me. Mary cowered, crying. You are Stacy's father. I just meant he's her biological father. Do you love him? I demanded, trying to stay calm. I don't know, she wailed. I knew it was a mistake, but I couldn't say no to him. It was like when we first met and married. I couldn't keep away from him. She was crying, gasping for breath and looking a mess. I handed her some tissues, feeling deflated and sorry for her. My anger had dissipated, replaced by a sense of disappointment. Mary wasn't the same person anymore, and I felt I was back at the start, dealing with another failed relationship. Despite not being the love of my life, her betrayal hurt deeply. I'll be sleeping in the guest suite tonight, I told her. Please move out as soon as you can. We'll tell people we drifted apart, like my mom and Stacy. Leaving the room, I felt like an old man. The next morning, I went to work, trying to focus, but it was tough. When I returned, Mary was gone. She had taken most of her things, but left a letter. Dearest Jerry, I'm deeply sorry for the hurt I've caused. You've done nothing to deserve my shameful behavior. I don't understand my attraction to Howard. I know he will destroy me. I've vowed never to see him again, but I'm unsure if I can keep that promise. You've been kind and loving. None of this is your fault. I've come to love you, which makes my actions even more horrible. I beg you not to hate me. All my love, Mary. I collapsed into a chair, the letter falling to the floor. I knew I would miss Mary, but I also felt relief. I needed solitude to get my head straight. Then, a thought struck me. I needed to take care of Howard Branch, for Mary, and for myself. I had his address and was determined to confront him that night. I changed clothes and drove to his seedy apartment building. When he opened the door, I pushed him off balance and entered closing the door behind me. He yelled, I'm going to tear your head off. But five seconds later, he was on the floor moaning. I pulled him into a sitting position and began to explain the situation. Listen carefully, Howard. My name is Jerry Ford. My friend's name is Mary Black. Understand? I slapped him and he nodded quickly. Good, I continued. I'm going to show you pain, but I won't leave many marks. For the next 20 minutes, I inflicted pain until he threw up twice and begged me to stop. I got a glass of water from his kitchen, threw it in his face, and then let him drink. I turned his face to me and said, Pack your stuff and leave this area, the southeast part of the country. Try California, Oregon, or Washington. If you're here 24 hours from now, you'll end up in a wheelchair for life. Do you understand? He nodded vigorously. I drove home, showered for half an hour, feeling sick about what I had done. I rationalized that it would benefit Mary, freeing her from Branch, but deep down I knew my actions were partly for revenge. I shook it off, deciding not to agonize over it. Howard Branch was gone the next day, talking with my mom and then Stacy was tough. They couldn't understand, and I refused to go into detail. Stacy threatened to fly home, but both Mary and I were firm and finally convinced her to stay at school. We'd talk later. I suspected Mary eventually told Stacy what had happened. When I spoke to my daughter next, she seemed subdued and sad. I'll always love you, Dad, she said, and it warmed my heart. Days and weeks went by. I got on with my life as it was. I had to decide about the company. Should I sell it or not? The potential buyer was patient, but wouldn't wait forever. He told me to take my time, saying, There's no rush. But he gave me a deadline. That date was approaching fast. I had a month. I wanted to sell and be free of the responsibility, but it was the only thing that gave my life purpose. What would I do if I sold it? So I procrastinated. Finally, a week before the deadline, I called and canceled the buyout. I would keep the company. Weeks turned into months and I became reflective, realizing I was now over 49 years old and nearing 50. What did I have to show for it? A successful company and a young lady who was my daughter in almost every sense. Stacy called every week without fail, and a solitary existence. Did I miss Mary? Sure. But it felt like missing Ben and Rachel. 
We had good years together, but we moved on. The last I heard, Mary was doing well at her job and dating. She would find someone. Did I mind being alone? Not really, I told myself. I guess I had gotten used to it. Jerry, I heard Gail, my secretary on the intercom. You have a visitor. I was busy with specs for a proposed job and was deeply involved. I was abrupt with her. Damn it, Gail, I'm busy. Handle it for me, she persisted. Jerry, I think you'll want to see him. It's Bernard Van Horn. And I could hear the laughter in her voice. Everyone here knew who Bernard Van Horn was. I froze for a second, then jumped to my feet and rushed out of my office. There, standing by Gail's desk, tall, slim, and white-haired, looking much younger than his seventy-some years, was Bernie Van Horn. I hugged him tightly, a lump in my throat preventing me from speaking right away. He hugged me back and patted my back. Okay, Jerry, let me breathe, he laughed. I stepped back and just looked at him. Damn, we had kept in touch, but this was my first time seeing him in about twenty years. I quickly ushered him into my office, and we sat in the small sitting area. I still couldn't believe my eyes. We talked, catching up on each other's lives. I knew he had recently sold his company. He told me he and Kate had moved to Naples a few weeks ago. They had discussed it for years, but never acted on it. On a whim, they flew down a month ago, looked at some properties, saw a home on the Gulf, fell in love with it, and bought it quickly. Bernie asked about my business and why I decided not to sell. I explained my reasons, and he nodded in understanding. Jerry, you know you'll have to visit us now that we're so close. Kate would be really upset if you didn't. I assured him I would, and we reminisced more. I talked about the early days of starting my company on a shoestring, barely making it before getting a couple of breaks. I saw a twinkle in his eyes, and then it hit me. My God, what an idiot I was. I never suspected, but I should have. It was Bernie. He gave my company the push it needed. I stumbled over my words trying to express my gratitude. Don't be silly, Jerry. All I did was call in a couple of favors. You took the ball and ran with it, and everyone saw the excellence of your work. Your company's success was due to your talent and hard work. I did very little, he said dismissively. There was a lull in our conversation, and I saw him looking at me expectantly. I knew what he was waiting for, and it was time anyway. I really wanted to know. I was more than curious, but also afraid. I knew that by opening this up, I might face more heartache. Bernie, how is Kimberly? Is she okay? Is she happy? I truly hope she's well. I said quietly. I saw Bernie sit back and let out a soft breath. I've been waiting a long time for you to ask, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Kate will be so happy you did. Now, about Kimberly. Bernie shifted in his chair, hesitated a bit, collected his thoughts, and began. It's been a long time since you left, and a lot has happened to her. I steeled myself, knowing her child was now grown. I expected to hear she had married and had a family. For some reason, I just didn't want to hear that. I really didn't want to hear that. Jerry, Bernie continued. Kim lost the baby about a month after you left. She had a malfunction. The doctors said she wouldn't be able to conceive again. I don't remember why. I'm not sure I understood it then. She had already quit her job at the publishing company. The divorce, malfunction, and aftermath left her clinically depressed. No, Jerry, it wasn't your fault. Don't start blaming yourself. What happened to Kim was her own doing, and she knew that. Her stupidity, as she called it, destroyed her world. We were really worried about her. It took months of therapy for her to recover. In a sad way, what happened changed her. She became more mature, responsible, and compassionate. I didn't know what to say. This was all new information, and it shook me. I had emotions roiling inside me but couldn't identify them. One thing was clear. Kim still stirred feelings in me. Just talking about her did that. Bernie shifted in his chair again. When things settled down and Kim was recovering, she told us she wanted to study medicine. We were stunned and thought it was part of her depression. But she assured us she had thought it through and really wanted to do it. Long story short, she enrolled at Penn's Medical School and became an MD, specializing in pediatric oncology. She knew she'd never have children and wanted to help others. Bernie paused and watched me. I didn't know what to say. Kim had loved her job as an editor, so it was shocking she had resigned. Maybe the pregnancy caused that. Losing the baby must have been devastating for her, though I couldn't muster sorrow for it given how she got pregnant. The rest of what Bernie told me stunned me. She couldn't have children, became a doctor, and specialized in pediatric oncology. Was this the Kim I knew? It was hard to process. Do you know why we moved here, Jerry? Bernie asked. 
The biggest reason, we wanted to be near Kim. We wanted to be near our daughter. I looked at him blankly. Near her? What? I sounded like an idiot. I was overloaded with information. Kim is here, Bernie said. She accepted the position as chief of pediatric oncology at the cancer center at the university in Tampa. She's been on the job for a couple of months now. Jerry, would you like to see her? Say hello, maybe? No, don't panic. She doesn't know I'm here. She'd be pissed if she knew I suggested it. But she knows you're in Tampa. Do you think that influenced her decision? He teased with a twinkle in his eyes. Jerry, all kidding aside, she would have accepted the job because it's what she wanted. But knowing you were here gave her pause. It's not that she didn't want to see you. She didn't want to complicate your life. I shook my head. I had to process everything Bernie was telling me. It was too much. I had to sort it all out. Bernie saw my confusion and stood up. Okay, Jerry. I know I just unloaded a lot on you. Think it over. I'll be in touch. I managed to stand up and walk him to the door. I watched him walk down the hall, then return to my desk, asking Gail to make sure I wasn't disturbed. I had a lot to think about. Kim. Kim is actually here in Tampa. My pulse quickened. I knew the questions I had to ask myself. What did I feel for Kim? Did I still love her? These were questions I'd avoided for years. But now they demanded answers. I wasn't going to lie to myself. I knew I loved Kim. But the Kim I married. What did I feel for this new Kim? The doctor in her mid-forties? I knew I had to see her, meet her, speak with her. Bernie and I kept in touch. I visited him and Kate in Naples and was relieved but sorry Kim wasn't there. I wanted to see her, but was fearful of what I might feel or not feel. I was a mess. One Saturday, Kate called and invited me down for the day. It was sunny and hot, and I had a few bathing suits there. I packed a clean shirt and drove down I-75. I let myself in the front door and called out their names. In the large sunroom at the back, I saw Kim standing by the sliding glass doors. My breath caught. She was about 20 feet away, silhouetted by the sun, but I knew it was her. My mind went back through the years. She hadn't changed. Still trim, taut, and well-groomed, I walked over, and we stood gazing at each other. Kim, I said softly. Hello, Jerry. It's good to see you. She extended a hand. I took it, and we shook hands as if meeting for the first time. In a sense, we were. Jerry, Kim continued, we didn't mean to trick you by my being here today. I begged my parents to let me do this. I really wanted to see you. I hope you're not angry with me or them. No, no, of course not, I reassured her. It's nice to see you again. And Kim, you look lovely, I added impulsively. I was oddly pleased to see her blush and smile. We moved into the solarium and sat on a white wicker set around a low glass-topped coffee table. Our conversation was initially awkward, with unnecessary pauses, but that didn't last long. After a few false starts, we both chuckled at the awkwardness and then relaxed a bit. The conversation started to flow more easily, with Kim telling me about her career and me sharing what I had been doing over the past few years. She already knew about Mary, thanks to Bernie and Kate. My mind was operating on two levels. Consciously, I participated in our conversation, mundane as it was. On another level, I was observing Kim, trying to understand her as a person. Despite the years, she still looked great. She wore a casual cotton polo and khaki shorts, showing off her tanned legs. Her hair was shorter than I remembered, and there were faint lines at the corners of her eyes and mouth. She looked terrific, but her eyes were different. There was a calm, mature confidence and tranquility I had never seen before. This was a self-assured, highly skilled professional, comfortable in her own skin. This was not the Kim I had courted and married, nor the Kim I had divorced and left. This was a whole new woman, and I realized I wanted to get to know her. We spent the day talking, having lunch she prepared, and lounging by the pool. I felt myself warming to her on different levels. I was attracted to her for the same reasons I had been when we were young. But she was so much more now. It was almost dusk when I realized the time. Kim, would you like to have dinner with me? I asked hopefully. She smiled. Jerry, I would love to, but I'm due at the center tonight. Can we make it tomorrow? We did, and we have been dating for the past two weeks. Is dating the right word? I knew I loved Kim. I guess I always have. And I love the woman she has become even more. Does she feel the same about me? We haven't discussed such carnal subjects yet. We were just dating as friends. The only physical contact we had were soft kisses to end the evening. Where will this end? I really don't know, but I'm hopeful. 